excuse me, as I did last class in session three, we began by um, closing out with a couple of paragraphs from the session before, and that's what we're gonna do this time. Last session, <clears throat> we were discussing forgiveness, and we're trying to get a grasp on forgiveness and repentance and those things in relationship to um, the righteousness of God or, and I think that throws us off a lot of times with that phrase, the justice of God, God being just in his dealing and in his, his uh, way that he proceeds based on his character and his nature. Um, so um, <clears throat> we were discussing at the very end there uh, this concept of grace <clears throat> that most Christians, most Christians are, have at least formulated some f theology of grace in their minds. I don't know that it's always based on the justice of God. It's more based on the love of God. And, and certainly the scriptures are clear to us that this thing was brought about by the love of God. But it wasn't just the love of God took over inside of God and said, okay, love get, or justice, get over there. We're in charge now, you know what I mean? And that half thing became a whole and it was all love. It was that love found a way to satisfy justice and, and express grace through that means. And, and of course, where we say, okay, well, grace is based on the cross and Jesus died for us and therefore we have grace. But whatever you call grace in that, Jesus doesn't because, you know, there was no grace for him. He suffered and he died. <clears throat> and, um, and yet it, that's how the justice got satisfied because he was a substitute. We'll get into that more a little later. Anyway, let me, let me catch up here with these two paragraphs. <clears throat> Wrong deeds aren't simply forgotten as though they never happened just because you say you're sorry. To grant mercy and forgiveness without the penalty being paid misses respect for the righteousness of God. Any government based on this is rotting from the inside out. Because of his holy nature, God can't overlook sin before God can forgive, he must first justify or make you and me righteous. The meaning of forgiveness to most people does not include the idea of justifying or justice or settling justice. <clears throat> before God can forgive sin, it must be judged. He judges it either individually as you stand before his throne after you die or in the person of a substitute who takes your punishment for you. <clears throat> Man's reward for sin is death. The wages of sin is death. It's death and it's, and it's punishment in hell. You cannot forgive someone and remain righteous unless that reward has been carried out. You can't just treat it as though it had never happened. God can't simply declare you and me forgiven. He must remain just in the process. <clears throat> all right. Now, hopefully this also makes you think in terms of forgiveness for one another. I mean, you, 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 be, you begin to, <clears throat> I mean, uh, you have to remember um, that uh, God's answer was death. I mean, it was self-giving. You have to remember that. You have to remember that it, the basis of it was love. The basis of it was in love taking what the other one deserved. <clears throat> and um, um, that that is his means and method of even satisfying justice. And you have to you have to realize beyond that, which we'll get into several chapters over here, you have to realize that through that cross, he didn't just um, suffer, suffer our punishment. He brought us into himself and then brought us into death 
and then rose again with us in him, and therefore now know we no man after the flesh, though we knew Christ after the flesh. <clears throat> well, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means to the average Christian. It means, oh, you know, we, now you're saved, and so, you know, I don't know you after the flesh. <clears throat> um, but that's, that's not even close to what those scriptures are referring to and to the transformation that has taken place. And let's face it, many people are ignorant of the true meaning of just new birth, being born from above. Okay. I don't mean they're ignorant of salvation. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that they don't know they're saved or whatever. That, there is a difference between salvation and new birth. <clears throat> and the word new, new, being born again, new birth, is in the Greek, it is being born from above. Oh, my God. Well, what's above? That's us in Christ. You know? That's where we are known now. <clears throat> and... Um, Jesus died for all of us before we knew anything about being that he was doing it for us or it was we were going to be forgiven or there was any benefit or anything. In fact, they were still enemies. They were still ungodly. And he did it to bring them into something whether they all knew it or not. And let's face it, all of them didn't. I mean, we have no record of Pontius Pilate going, I'm sorry, Jesus, you know what I mean? I mean, or anybody else doing that stuff. We, we, you know, a lot of people don't get it, and they don't turn. <clears throat> but they could have, because Jesus did die for that. And that was, and that was with him a heart thing. Yeah. It was something that came from his heart, or something that came out of love, not out of justice, <clears throat> but because of his kind of love, he would die or he would bear the punishment or he would become a curse or he would, all of those things, all of those things that we are and that the person that you're having a hard time getting forgiveness with <laughs> is probably, <laughs> including me. Um, <clears throat> that work of Christ crucified within us. It's not us. It's not us being a part of the atonement. It is Christ's self-giving nature. It is after salvation. It is a continuation of his nature and his being that can yet die when the other person deserves it. That's justice. They deserve it. He can yet die. That's love. All right. Now, <clears throat> great, great subject, great talk, right? The theology of this will fall down around your ankles if you don't have it as life in you. It's not, it's not meant to be a lesson. It's not. It's not meant to be a lesson that we teach in the church and you, you listen and you get it. Because, again, you'll think you got it until you get into a really bad situation and you'll turn out like Habakkuk, you know what I mean? Lord, why do you show? These people are horrible. Get them. He goes, okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll get them. But you're included with them. I mean, if I'm going to get them, them, I've got to get you because all of sin comes short. So I'm sending Babylon, man. They're going to wreak havoc upon your head. Wait a minute, Lord, you know. And you just begin to see things in a different light because, you know, whatever, let's just face it, whatever degree of goodness we think we have is relative to, you know, we, we're, I'm relatively better than that person, but, you know, someone's better than me. But none of us measure up to Christ. Okay? That's why we all get the same life. We all get Jesus inside of us, not just in heaven covering us and praying for us and all that. Inside of us. That's the only reason. I mean, you know, to, to save us from hell and punishment and all that didn't require... Uh, that he, he come in the inside of us. 
It wasn't necessary. Okay, so then what's the purpose? What is that all about then? I mean, why not just save us, go sit on a throne, and all of us go, praise God, I can't wait to be with you. And, you know, that would be what it's all about. And, you know, and then he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sort of goes, don't do that. And you go, okay, I'm sensitive to the Holy Spirit because I love Jesus, you know. Well, I just described Christianity to a lot of people. who That's how they view it, you know. But no, he put his son in us. Pardon? In order to be with us. Yeah, well, and that was, you know, you see that, uh, Shay said, in order, he put his son in, in order to be with us, and you see that incredible reality when they were God's people in Egypt, and he saved them from Egypt, and he saved them from punishment, meaning being beaten because you didn't do your tasks right for the Egyptians, you know what I mean? The, the, the Egyptians' taskmasters and, and all the forced labor and all of the hard living and all that. He saves us out of that, and he, and he brings us out, you know, out of all of that. And as soon as he gets you out into the wilderness, he says, okay, I want to build a tabernacle right in the midst of you, and I want to dwell with you. Well, what's that all about? That's got nothing to do with salvation. I mean, they're already saved, if you will, you know. Okay, now we're dealing with not issues of, well, these poor dumb creatures need help, and I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to save them. Now you're dealing with, some, you're dealing with something deeper in his heart toward us and being, as Shay said, with us. Instead of, instead of us being with him. I'm talking about heaven. You know, because if it was really, I, you know, I just want you in heaven, then once you got saved, there would be built into that, yeah, there would be built into that pill that you take, you just die and go be with him. You know what I mean? I got saved, oh God, another one left. Oh my God, that one went to heaven too. Because... Is they're the only ones dying, you know, after they take that pill. <clears throat> that, that brings up those questions. That says, Lord, why did you, why did you come down? Why did you want to be with us? And, then, and, and yet, even, even the picture of the tabernacle, which is a picture of the incarnation, wasn't enough for God. So he builds a temple, and that temple is, is beyond the incarnation, it's Christ in the church. It's us as the temple of God and him in us. In that way, not just with us, you know. You know. <clears throat> All of those things have to be pondered in a real way. And, ha and, and we, have to, we have to admit, all of us have to admit, I don't know all of this. Because we don't, but how do we know we don't know it all? Just because, look at us, if nothing else. We're so incomplete with our forgiveness. We're so, we, st we struggle, struggle with, with things that we shouldn't be struggling with. But that's just the negative side. There is, um, there is just the general reality that there's so much more of the Lord than what I know. Amen. And so, if he's worthy, if he's worth it, then we pursue him with all of our hearts, regardless. So you don't have to know how short you can, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory. You don't have to need to know how short of that glory to have a heart that pursues after him. I mean, let's face it, when, when you think you're doing good and God exposes and shows something in you that's really yucky to you and you do love Jesus, you go, oh, and it really does sort of make you, you start, you know, praying a little more. You know, you start reading the Bible a little more, you know. Oh, I need you, Lord. But you needed him before that. Right. That was in you then. Why, you know, why can't you just go? And we do. I know we do. But why can't we just... You know, say, Lord, I already know it. You don't need to show me. I'm coming. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, I'm never turning the engine off, and I'm not dropping into lower gears. I'm only going to find out how many gears are in this thing and keep pursuing after you. Therefore, 
the re- I mean, you know, if I see something in me that is not Christ, I don't freak out. I don't. Not like I used to. I used to. I used to go, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. You know, and I, f- I feel really bad for him, you know, because, oh, my God, you know, I just failed him as if he didn't know that was already at work in me, you know. Like, you know, and this is the way I always felt. When I would fail God, I would feel like God would go, oh, oh my God. You know, he's God, but he'd go, oh, my me. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you know, and and just be appalled at what just happened. No. He already knows our frame. He already knows all that stuff's in us. So when I fail, I just go, Lord, you know, Father, there you go. I need more of Jesus. I need Christ formed in me. I want more of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you're sent to be my God. You need to kick us up, buddy, because look at what I just did. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get quite that bad. But, but, I mean, there's the thought. I mean, I, let me tell you what I do. I let him know that he's supposed to be my teacher and my helper and my guide into Christ. That's what the scripture says. I say, hey, you know, clearly I'm a mess. You know, so I'm going to need a little help here. Like, can, we, can we bump it up just a little bit for, for the glory of Jesus? You know, I try, to, I try to stay out of it as much as I can. So it's really an issue of them. And then, you know, yes. Isn't that huge reaction of just shock and horror of our own shortcomings? Isn't that really kind of a symptom of how much we're not even Right. You know what I'm saying? We think we're right. all that, and it's so important that we're righteous and that we are righteous. Somehow, deep down, we think that, or we wouldn't be so devastated when we see what's wrong. Right. You know? And, 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 and we'd be like, well, oh, sure. <laughs> and, that, and that being the case, it legitimizes the Lord's allowing us to be exposed for what we are because we thought more highly of ourselves. And, you know, and that's, the scriptures are clear. It says, you know, th- not to think more highly of yourself, that, you know. Um, and, and it says, you know nothing yet as you ought. And instead of going, you know, I don't know nothing, or I don't know anything's a problem. I don't know anything, you know. That's not true. Quit going against the Word of God. The Word of God says you know nothing yet as you ought, but it didn't say you don't know anything. I mean, you know, those are tricks of the enemy. I, I, I want you to know that because you see it right off in the, in the garden with the, the attack against Eve and, you know, Adam and Eve there. And, and the, he comes and he says, you know, uh, God says, you know, eat freely. Here's God's words. Eat freely of every tree in the garden, but don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Here's the devil's word. Yea, hath God said that you cannot eat of every tree of the garden? I mean, listen to the difference. God says eat freely of all. The devil says, if God said that you can't eat of every tree, meaning I'm so limited and bound, I can't eat of every tree. Well, yeah, you know, you can eat of all of them but one, for God's sake. But it's, a, it's, an, it's, an, it's an imagery that the enemy gives us and makes us, you know, makes what is truly still wide feel very cramped and limited. And uh, per- discontent. But it's a wording that brings us into that because it's like we, we, we picture a little box instead of a wide, beautiful garden with all of this lusciousness and only one thing you can't have and go, well, thank you for all of this. You know. Well, <clears throat> you know, we're susceptible to those things if... Um, if our expectations aren't what the Lord is shooting for. And let's face it, I don't think any of our expectations are all lined up yet, you know? And so what does that say? We need Jesus, and we, and we need him right now. We need him today. We need him at every moment. And, you know, I say it over and over again. I am not ashamed of that fact that I need Jesus. And... You know, some of you have been around long enough to know when, you know, a particular point where I was really being pounded by people, and they say, you know, somebody came to me and said, well, you did this, and you failed with that, and you, all this, and you, da-da-da-da, and I said, is, 
is that your complaint against me? They said, yeah. And I said, oh, you, got, you don't know nothing. I am way worse than that. I said, would you like for me to go down, you know, some more, give you some more fodder? Because I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and then I need Jesus. But, you know, I, you know, I don't glory in the fact that I still need the Lord, but we will, I assume, always need the Lord. Um, uh, I was thinking of, I was thinking about this. It may be something that I share in Ireland on the thing, but I was thinking about in Song of Solomon where, where, the, where he's coming out of the wilderness, and and it's all it's like this beautiful perfume cloud of him and then you look closer and there she is leaning on her beloved and it just i mean i got goosebumps right now when i saw it it just thrilled me because i saw that she's never, ever going to be in any other position. She'll always be in that position of dependence and need of him. And that that is, that is the way it's supposed to be. That, what we're looking at there is the deal, you know what I mean? And yet, and yet in the minds of most Christians, or a lot of Christians, what, what's trying to transpire is we want to get so strong and stuff where we don't need the Lord so much. Really? Is that, I mean, is that should that should that be the case? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to just work my way out of needing Jesus. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, that don't that don't sound right. So, <clears throat> so there is a there is that heart condition that um, expects failure in relationship to an earthen vessel, but believes in fullness in relationship to the treasure. And it, and it, 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 it balances you, it, it stabilizes you, it, it makes you humble, not in the, the religious way, oh, I'm humble, but in a very tender-hearted way towards the Lord because you realize every good and perfect gift comes from above, from him and from his reality and mine in him. And that's all, I, that's the only reality I want and everything else will pass away, you know. This too shall pass. <laughs> Brother came to me once, Pastor, pray for me, I got a gallstone. I said, this too shall pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need to get back here. <laughs> yeah, it's it, with uh, Kelly and Deb and some of them, it's like a grenade jokes. You go like this, you go. All of a sudden, <laughs> it goes off, you know, after a little while. Everybody else, <laughs> and then it goes on. <laughs> 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 All right, so why did the cross have to happen? Now remember, we're talking in relationship to redemptive, redemptive, redemption truths, RT, RTs. And uh, <clears throat> so we're not talking about all the different aspects of the cross. We're talking specifically in, in this area. Uh, in what way does the death of Christ keep us from destruction and punishment? In parentheses, I have this said after that statement. Aren't you glad I ask a lot of questions? <laughs> this was written in the throes of a lot of questions, so that's why all that's in there. <clears throat> Thank God, Paul proclaims, that God has found a method by which he remains just and at the same time the justifier of those who come to him. See, there's that wording. I mean, that's, that's that wording that he gets. Thank God that he remains just. And we would just get out of that, that, you know, he justified us. But Paul is stating God in his, I mean, and, and there, is no, there is no way to fully express the, um, 
enmity between a holy God and us apart from Christ. Okay. There's no way to express that. <clears throat> but somehow it seems these Jews, you know, Job, and it seems that they understand that there is, you know, that it, this is an amazing thing that God could still be just and yet justify us. Can you believe it? It's like wonder of wonders to them. I love that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Through his method, mercy and truth are met together, and righteousness have, and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What a, what a beautiful way to say that. And, but, it, but it comes together in Christ crucified. In Christ crucified. Since God's holiness cannot be satisfied unless the requirements of the holy law have been met, his answer is that he set forth Christ as a propitiation. <clears throat> and I wrote, that's a, that's a pretty big word. It means that Jesus was substituted for us. <clears throat> it's the same word as vicarious. You ever read something, he was a vicarious sacrifice. It means he was substitutionary sacrifice. Propitiation, same basic thing. <clears throat> um, substitution speaks of a replacement of someone acting on behalf of another. The substitute restrains the wrath of God and postpones the immediate death of the person, <clears throat> uh, and in this case, postpones it forever. I'm, I'm just trying to give the definition of a, a vicarious in that situation. Neither one of these words are used in scripture, but the truth of it is well documented. Here are some examples of substitution. Genesis 15, 7 through 17, the animals, Sacrificed by Noah. Genesis 22, 13, and 14, the ram caught in the thicket. Sacrificed in place of, of uh, Isaac. Yes? But, Echo, the one on the count of Genesis 15, 7 to 17, it should be Abraham. Abraham is in Genesis 15. Noah is like Oh, six you're right. Nine. You are right. But Noah did sacrifice him. It's just a wrong application there. Thank you. And then Leviticus uh, 1 through 7, all the sacrifices of the tabernacle. 80 billion, <laughs> 80 billion that's right. <clears throat> so I think there's pretty good grounds for believing in substitution is, is what I'm trying to communicate here. <laughs> all right, the only proper substitute for man is man. An animal is not a proper substitute. And where, you know, where do, we, where do we get that? That the only one is man is man. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah. You know, for some reason I just went blank. But it's the one that uh, um, since by death came through man, so the resurrection. I think Romans five is one place. But I was trying to think of it. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, is that what it is? Uh, for, yeah, it is, 15, 21. For since by, death came, uh, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. <clears throat> all right. So clearly that's one of the reasons why Jesus was incarnated. As a man. Incarnated is uh, Jerry. What's uh, "carne" mean in Spanish? Is he is he on there? Doug, Doug. What's "carne" mean in Spanish? Flesh. It means flesh. <laughs> She's going. They're tapping it in right now. <clears throat> and it's flesh. <clears throat> he became flesh. He became man. All right. An animal is not a proper substitute. You must substitute sub something of equal value. It must be 
of like nature. When Jesus died on the cross, he died as a substitute. He became a man in order to die for man. The cross vindicated God's righteousness because God had to judge our sins if he was to remain righteous himself. The cross is the place where all of our sins were judged. The propitiation was done, or the substitution, um, or the vicarious sub, uh, sacrifice was done to satisfy holiness, but it was initiated and motivated by love. And that, my friends, is, is the balance that has to be maintained. Because some lean so heavily toward love, you know. It's what I call sloppy agape. <clears throat> you know, it lets everybody off the hook and, and just hugs everybody and says, oh, it, it, it'll be okay. No, it won't. If you don't bring them through the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, they're going to stand before God based on that, thinking they were okay because you hugged them and said it's going to be all right. Can I get an old me? <laughs> so... Um, but on the other hand, there are some who are just, you know, well, God hates sin. And, you know, we've, we've been to Mardi Gras where we've seen signs, you know, held up that were just incredibly, oh, my God, you know, God hates, God hates you and God hates sin and he hates you and he, he hates, pardon? Yeah. And you're going to hell and God's glad about it and all this stuff. And you're just going, dude, have you ever heard of the cross? Amen. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> and boy, there's no there's no arguing with them because they're they're angry elves. They are South Pole elves. <laughs> and it's true. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So. Um, <clears throat> So only the Spirit of God can bring us into the balance of that because it is not a balance of truths of God's righteousness and God's love. It's, a, it's the balance of knowing the person because this is an issue of, of the, the being of God, the essence of God, the nature of God, righteousness and love and all these things. Those things are him. And there is no theological balance to that. We, the, and the one main reason is, is that because if we are knowing him in that, then we are seeing him and being changed into that same image from glory to glory. Therefore, what is him is him in us, and it begins to work in us. Does that make sense? It's because it's life. <clears throat> If we try to theologically divide these parts of God and see, we will tend to lean toward one side or the other depending on our past, our culture, our, you know, the things we've gone through, who's hurt us or who, who has been, you know, who saved us because they loved on us when we were an orphan or something like that. You know, there's all these factors that will, will influence us and say this is the right thing because I have proof. You know, in our experience, there's no proof of who God is. I mean, it's not. It's not our experience. It is knowing the Lord. That's why it's not enough to just experience the movement of the Holy Spirit in a service or something. That's great. But we need to know the Lord. We need to know him. Amen? Amen. And that doesn't take away the movement of the Holy Spirit. I encourage it. But it doesn't put them on an equal basis either. Because that same Holy Spirit was sent to us to, to teach us Christ. And once Christ is formed within us, <clears throat> then the Holy Spirit can move without us getting puffed up. You see how, you see how we have all of these things in us. I mean, God, God can move by his Holy Spirit on you or me. And when the service is over, we can feel really good about ourselves. When we, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, oh, that was really good. So it wasn't me, it was the Lord. But there's something smiling on their face like, yeah, I did good, you know. <clears throat> and, um, and that's not true of everybody, but I'm just saying, you know. I mean, I went, 
I went through that, and I think everybody has a, a time period in there. And, and if you don't have it, you have seen somebody in a church service that because they would always move in the gifts of the Spirit, they would become some sort of a special person instead of a vessel. Well, I mean, instead of a... <laughs> yeah, instead of, a, instead of just a vessel that the Lord feels he can use. <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot that to explain on that, but all, there's also a lot to explain on this reality of, of righteousness and love. The explanations never suffice because the answer is Christ Amen. and knowing him. And if, and, if, and if you begin again to see him, the scriptures say you are changed into that same image from glory to glory. And then the same, I'm, I'm sorry I'm using crummy language here, but the same value system that is him works in you as him. So it's equal. It's equal. It's equal. <clears throat> um, and then we're not leaning towards our culture or our Things, things like that. <clears throat> um, all right, so uh, Jesus became a man in order to die for man. The cross vindicated God's righteousness because God had to judge our sins if he was to remain righteous himself. The cross is the place where all our sins were judged. The propitiation was done to satisfy holiness, but it was initiated by love. And I used 1 John 4, 8 through 10. The uh, sacrifice of Jesus didn't open the door for God to begin to love us. That we've, we've dealt with this before in other classes, but some people feel that you know, God was just an angry God until Jesus came along, and thank God that his son was nice, you know, and saved us from an angry God. <clears throat> no understanding, again, of, of justice and love. God always loved us. Okay. We have to understand that. But he also has this righteous side that needs to be satisfied properly. Okay. So once it's satisfied, we go, God loves me. You know, he didn't used to. He used to hate me. <laughs> See, and this is, you know, I'll just, I'll just tell you this. This, in a nutshell, is the explanation of the prophets. <clears throat> it is. Because the prophets would hear from God's righteous side, and, he, and, and, <clears throat> and uh, they would be angry with their sin and angry with their ways and angry with all of that stuff. And yet, at the same time, God would say, but there shall be a return. Da, da, da. He's talking about the cross now. He's talking about Christ crucified as the answer that's coming. He doesn't spell it out every time, but that's what's going on. And so, so you know, they're going, well, why is God so mean? And why is he out to get us and all this stuff? He loves them. But it's going to take the, the cross to vindicate his righteousness so that he can release that love for us. <clears throat> um, okay, so the sacrifice of Jesus didn't open the door for God to begin to love us. He always loved us, and that love set forth the propitiation. But it did not void out his holiness. The propitiation of Jesus justifies God's holiness and is a guarantee that we are now saved from wrath. <clears throat> All right. So we're not there yet, but I don't want you to be thinking wrong thoughts. So I'm going to try to close out here with just a few thoughts. <clears throat> and that is we're talking about satisfying God's holiness and everything. And the conclusion that someone might come to at listening to this last part is that, okay, God still has this righteous side, and so he's, you know, Jesus died to save us, and, and he justified God's righteousness, but we're in trouble because he's still going to be expecting it. I mean, does that, I mean, is, is that a proper line of thought for some of you 
backslidden, half-hearted, fence riding. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. I'm joking. <clears throat> but, it, but, but I can understand that. God's answer, folks, is Christ. His answer is not Christ just um, as a dying Savior, but Christ as life. Okay. The, the main reason why there's... The, you know, I'll just say it like this. The main reason why there's so much sin in the church is because there's so little Christ formed in the church. Okay. <clears throat> well, the, the main reason why, you know, there's so much problems and sin or whatever in me or in you, at, even at this stage, is because Christ hasn't been formed in us. Okay. Instead of being condemned over that again, that, Every failure should be like a, a motivating factor that causes us to rise up and go harder after the Lord. Instead of falling down in a little heap of flesh and going, <laughs> you know, or just ignoring God and saying, you know, you know what I mean? You can just shut him out and say, well, this is, this is the way I am or this is the way I want to live. That's fine. But to me, to me, the, the easier answer is, if you're not ready to be transformed into his image fully in, that, in those areas, because you have your pet areas and people do, then you, and I've, I've addressed this before, you tell the Lord. You tell him, look, you know, uh, you and me are partner. You're my father, you know. Uh, Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm just not ready to do this. But, but, but again, and I, I'm always saying this, but... I just think it, it's worthy of being said over and over and over. And that is, but Lord, if there's some way that you can move in me and change my heart on these issues, I'd, I'll be with you if, you know, as long as I'm with you on it. But if it's, you know, you ripping it out of my hands and telling me to shape up, I would really rather have you work in me by life, these things. Yeah. And that's why I'm resisting you now or whatever, you know. <clears throat> and, and the truth is, if you get that way with the Lord, not only will he deal with that, but it will begin to form a habit which it works into a lifestyle of how you relate to these things so that there's not a breach every time you do something wrong or fail. You know that he's still your father and you can address these issues in this manner and say, hey, remember how we worked out that last one? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, but I need you. You know, it's better than saying, well, I'm a righteous Pharisee and I'll just do it. You know what I'm saying? Or the opposite of that, a, 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 a pile of seething self-pity flesh that's bubbling, going, well, I can't go, and just not doing anything and just living in, in regret and self-pity the whole time. <clears throat> It's be with the Lord where you can and trust the Lord where you can't meet him with that. All right, we're, uh, um, we're going to get more deeply next class into Jesus as our substitute and, and the finer points of that. Um, because in each of these simple areas that seem so common knowledge as far as theology are incredibly, uh, it's not gems hidden in them like little jewels. It is seeds of life hidden in them. And our goal is to find the seeds of life, not the gems and hold it in our hand and go, oh, this is a great truth, and then walk around impressing people with what we know but to lay hold of that which has all the potential within it to produce what it's about. and Get that buried deep within us. Some will water, some plant. God will give the increase. Amen. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are, are with you, and we, we thank you for <clears throat> the, the death of Christ as our substitute. We thank you as our propitiation um, but father we don't want to just get these in a class and go into our head 
and think we understand why we continue to falter. We really ask you with all of our heart to plant seeds of life in each of these truths. Plant them within our being. And continue to give the increase. We look to you, not to ourselves. But we trust you. We believe that you, what you plan for us is not the hard things that we think they are when we can't see them for what they really are. We think that, that your heart really is a heart of love that motivated even the fulfilling of the justice side of your being. And so, in humility, we ask you, Lord, just have your way in us and keep us soft and tender. Keep us open. And keep, keep us, Father, as a little child that you never let go of our hand. And even if we sort of start trying to slip our hand out of your hand to run ahead or run back, that you give us the grace to keep our hand in your hand until you've grown us up, until you've brought us into your fullness. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.